and one. All right, welcome to I Have Been Wondering. I am uh, uh, broadcasting to you today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squ Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people uh, here on the Coast Salish uh, territories. As a newcomer, as a refugee, I arrived here six years ago to Canada, almost seven years here to Canada. And I was an uninvited guest here in this lands. And yet the people, the First Nations people have been uh, one of my biggest supporters. Uh, I have so many friends and so many brothers and sisters and siblings in the uh, First, uh, First Nations communities that, it, that I truly felt loved and supported by. So I'm thankful for uh, allowing me to continue being uh, an uninvited guest here on this lands. I invite you to also research wherever you're watching uh, this show from. I invite you to research your own lands and to, um, to participate in acknowledging and decolonizing the lands that you're on. Today's guest is my honor to introduce to you Farzana Doctor, who comes today with her new latest book, Seven. Let's say hi to Farzana. Hi, Farzana. Hi, Danny. Thank you so uh, much for having me. And I'm, I just want to say a special thing about you. Um, oh. This is a labor of love uh, that requires quite a lot of labor to organize this series. And so I really want to thank you for doing that. It's a labor of love because this, you know, builds community. It, uh, you know, uplifts all of us. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. I really appreciate you saying that. Um, this, this show has been um, honestly, one of the proudest things that I did in 2020, but also it reminds me all the time how lucky I am that I can like pick up the phone and text Joshua or text you, Joshua Whitehead or you or uh, jail for all of all of those folks and be like, hey, do you want to come on my show and, and just like talk for a bit? And people are like, yeah, sure. Yeah. So I feel so great that people trust me with their voices. And I'm so thankful that you today trust me with your voice. Thank you so much, Prezana. Uh, let me read your bio. How about that? I have a fantastic bio right here. Prezana Doctor is the Toronto-based author of four novels, Steely Nasreen, Six Meters of Pavement, All Inclusive, and Seven, which was released in the fall of 2020. I'm sorry. Farzana was recently named one of CBC's book, uh, books 100 writers in Canada you need to know now. She's also an activist, part-time psychotherapist, and an amateur tarot card reader. You may know more about Farzana on her website, farzanadoctor.com. Now, um, I said I'm sorry because both of us had to release books in 2020. I had to release uh, my children's book in uh, the sum in the spring of 2020, a week after the quarantine started, and you had to release in uh, the fall of 2020. But mm -hmm. still, I think uh, I have been reading all the reviews about Seven. I just finished reading the book. I think it's a triumphant book. It has been uh, quite well received. So I'm so thankful we get to spend some time today talking about it. Uh, do you mind if I just jumped in with my just, first question? Yeah. Just jump in, yeah. All right. So, hey Farzana, I have been wondering. I have been wondering lately about trauma, as one does. We tend to handle trauma, specifically as people of color, like we handle wound. We consider it ac acute and almost mendable. However, when we write, we start to unpack not only the traumatic experiences of our own past, but also the generational traumas we carry and the interpersonal traumas that we hold and we share between each other. How do you navigate your art while writing about trauma? How do you ensure you are writing an authentic story while digging deep into the generational, societal, and interpersonal traumas, as well as personal traumas that you're writing about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a big question. It almost sounded like you were you were reading a poem when you started. Um, there was that kind of cadence around, and I think I think we have to be so like generous around this issue of trauma. And and you know, with this book, this was probably the book where I really, really had to dive deep. Um, 
you know, previous books have addressed some difficult issues for sure and, you know, social justice issues. But this was a book where I had to really take a look at my own history, my, my, the intergenerational family history in a very particular way. And so I think there were like a bunch of things I was trying to figure out at the same time, right? This, mm -hmm. this was complicated. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in the writing, I was trying to write trauma in this very varied kind of way. Like I wanted to look at specifically Kutna. So I'm, I'm writing about Kutna, which is a form of female genital cutting that happens in the community that I'm from, which is the Dawuri Bora community. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe I'll just say Dawuri Boras are a subsect of Shia Islam. Most mm -hmm. people don't know about us because it's a very insular community. So this is, this is an issue that until 2015, there really wasn't any public discourse about it. You know, the conversations that people were having in our community were whispers, if mm. anything. Mm -hmm. it, the issue is so taboo that still, still people don't really wanna talk about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I joined an activist group in 2015 as a way to try to grapple with this issue at the same time I was grappling with my own personal trauma around it. And mm -hmm. then, you know, I was waking up in the morning with my cup of coffee, fully formed fictional scenes were just pouring out. So mm -hmm. there, there were all of these levels of things happening at the same time. And, you know, from working with my activist comrades, I really learned that there are so many varied experiences around this trauma. Some people mm -hmm. will barely feel that they have any uh, traumatic consequences whatsoever. They'll say it's harmless. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who will say that it's the hardest, worst thing that they've had to encounter in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be able to write all of that. And then I also wanted to be able to talk about this in a very nuanced way. Sometimes this issue isn't talked about in a nuanced way. And unless we talk about it in a nuanced way, we're never gonna be able to change it. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't want there to be villains in this story. I wanted there, even the people who were pro Kutna, I wanted to be able to talk about them as survivors of Kutna too, as intergenerational survivors. So. I was thinking about so many things at the same time. And when I first started writing the book, I was mostly enraged about this issue um, because I was, that's where I was, you know, focused in my own personal healing. And then over time, as I began to really work with some of the characters who were characters who are so different from me, who believe things mm -hmm. so different from me, I really started to like, I don't know, so something happened. I felt, softer and lighter about the mm. issue. I felt, um, I don't know, more complicated about the issue. I felt uh, more forgiving towards the people in my family. Mm -hmm. And um, just around trauma. So I, I did a lot of work in the last number of years. So, you know, regular therapy. I'm a, I'm a trauma therapist myself. So I knew where to go for that. I did my regular therapy. But I also, um, you know, have all of these kind of different spiritual beliefs. And so I saw psychics who mm -hmm. um, helped me work on, you know, there's this idea, right? That if, if we in this generation start to heal, we heal the previous generations too. So we, we did that kind of work, you know, with kind of more psychic type of healers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, so it's such a complicated thing. and. Um, maybe I'll ask you a question about this because you started out <laughs> saying, I've been wondering about trauma as we do. Um, you know, I read the clothesline swing a um, few months ago and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wondered so much about what were the pieces that you were bringing in from your own experience and mm -hmm. what it was like mm -hmm. to bring in those kinds of pieces. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about that, to be honest, lately, because I'm I'm working on my... So I have a novel coming out in a year and a half, and um, I am working on a memoir to come out uh, a year later. And I have been thinking specifically about my relationship with The Clothesline Swing and my own traumas, and how when I wrote The Clothesline Swing, I was in active trauma. 
I wasn't in a time where I could look back at the trauma in my life and find um, a place of healing. I was I was writing the clothesline swing while I was still a refugee in Lebanon. Um, I witnessed multiple explosions during that time. I was writing for the Washington Post, uh, like my my day job was writing for the Washington Post. So part of my daily life was waking up in the morning and turning on TV and watching the horror that is happening in my country right next door and reporting on it while also following the guidelines of how to report impartially um, for the Washington Post when, I, when like the headlines that I had in my mind is people are dying, you motherfuckers. So <laughs> it was, it was, it was a book that I wrote, The Close Line Swing is a book that I wrote in active trauma. And I would say that there was a lot of navigation of my own personal history in that, um, that is mixed with fiction, that is mixed with autobiography, that is mixed with uh, things that I should have been saying to a therapist rather than putting in a book. Um, and they all came out together and created this this magical book that I had that that truly, honestly changed my life. Um, and I was ashamed of it for the longest time, I have to say. Like I was ashamed of how trauma informed my fiction in the clothesline swing. and when when I would when I was asked about that in day to day, uh, life as an author, I would say like, no, 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 this is, this is all fiction. I have no idea what you're talking about, but now I feel more comfortable being like, you know what? Yes, I am in a place of healing and I can look back at those traumas and I can, I can start to unravel that thread of craziness that, that came together and created that book. And, and I'm more comfortable telling you, yeah, this is the fiction and this is, this is the, um, mm -hmm. the autobiography. And it's Such it's an interesting. In yeah, go ahead. So go. It's it's an interesting way to put it as like active trauma, um, you know, versus past, past, past trauma, and mm -hmm. how different the writing process is when it's the stuff from like a long time ago versus the stuff you're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I I found that in your book. I found that in your book quite a lot. Like I I was telling you before we went live how. I found that the book is so well structured. And then I was surprised when you were like, no, I'm I I I wrote it like scene after scene, the way like it came. And I'm I'm like, there is a lot of clarity in what you're bringing, and there's a lot of um maturity in the way that you're handling the different characters and bringing the different point of views of um of the the katna. In Arabic, we call it khatna. So it's it's actually a very uh, close word. Um, so I found that there is, for something that is so traumatic that you are talking about, that that you, you just said that it's something that is personal to you, it's still, you're capable of holding that, that wiser space and, and telling a mature story is something that truly stood out for me. Thanks. It, you know, it was, I think, because I had the benefit of um, activist comrades, right? Mm -hmm. We were talking and talking and talking about our experiences. And then I also had the benefit of really great therapy. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the combination of the two things. And, you know, while this is a trauma from like 45 years ago, um, mm -hmm. it was trauma that I was uh, dredging up um, mm -hmm. at the point of writing the book. So it was kind of an active, active trauma too. And it's the first, really, it's the first time that I've done that. Um, all of the themes in previous books have um, been further distanced from my life or about things that didn't feel so difficult or so immediate to work through. Mm -hmm. So that was, I'm, I'm glad I did this. Um, and I'm also looking forward to writing something new that isn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I hear you. I did recommend your book, however, I have to say, because I lived in Egypt for a while and uh, I, have a, I have a group of uh, female friends who live in Egypt and many of them have shared with me 
being the gay man, I think gives me access to, especially in the Arab world, gives me access to, to female conversations because it's a, such a gender segregated society with like a belief in that binary. Um, yeah. So a lot of them shared with me their stories about Khatna, about mm -hmm. uh, female um, um, mutilation. And and I recommended your book and, and I, I, I have to say one of them was quite moved because she was like, it always feels that you are the only person in the world that has been through this. So having that moment is uh, having that shared moment and having it in a book that is published that is out there just tells that this experience is valid. So thank you for that. Mm, now, thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Go I'm ahead, hoping always. that it becomes like it's really been very interesting, and also this is a new experience with this book compared to other books because it is so focused on an issue like that is you know something we're talking about more and more these days it, it actually feels like we're having a me too movement around fgm where more women in more countries are speaking up you know these days we're understanding that it happens in 92 countries and counting because more survivors mm -hmm. are coming forward and mm -hmm. so this book has already been this like amazing vehicle for you know talking about this very silenced invisible issue mm -hmm. um and so i'm you know i'm glad for that because you know, prior to that, it was very hard to enter these conversations mm -hmm, uh, publicly. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm doing it through a, you know, a, a literary, a work of literary fiction, and that that feels like somehow easier to do. Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. have I hear you. I hear you. So, um, I usually hear where here is the point where I ask you to read a bit, but I feel like this conversation has been rightfully so heavy. So I'm going to bring a story that is completely different. So I tweeted about this a couple of days ago. Uh, I'm invited to a school visit uh, to eight year olds to read from my children's book. And I asked the teacher if they, if they can gather questions from the students and get students to ask me questions. And I got a list of the most amazing questions that I've ever received in my life, including what are your dreams like? Uh, were you sad when uh, when the book, uh, sorry, were you nervous when the book came out and that some people might not like it and stuff like that? So my favorite question of those was, uh, what do you enjoy the most about writing? And I want to throw that to you, Farzana. What do you enjoy the most when you're sitting down and writing? Yes. Um, so there, there are these moments of incredible flow where you're just sitting and you don't know where these words are coming from. You don't know where these ideas are coming from, but they're coming and they're just flowing. And um, I think that's what I love the most is sort of the mystery and like being receptive to the mystery of those words. And, um, you know, there are times when I'll, I'll read my work after the fact and I'll think, did somebody give that to me? Like, like I don't, I don't know exactly which brain cell produced that. So that's what I love the most is the mystery, the magic, and I that doesn't happen every agree. day. <laughs> <laughs> that happens only on some days. You know, let's face it. There's a lot of tedium. There's a lot of the blank page. There's a lot of fear, yeah. but mm -hmm. um, there's also these moments of beauty. Yeah. I completely agree. I wish I know what is the, the 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 magical ingredient because like I have my coffee every day and I drink enough water and I I don't know I eat the right foods and I do and then certain days out of nowhere you sit down and you have that magic moment when I'm like talking to myself as I'm writing. Matthew goes crazy because my, Matthew is my husband. He goes crazy because I'm like sitting there typing and then talking and then laughing a bit and then going back typing and it's it's like i am in this weird ass zone it's the weirdest thing out there um and i don't know how to how to uh, manufacture it to be honest i wish i know no. um yeah anyway this is your time this is your <laughs> moment how about you read us a bit my friend sure yeah so if anybody wants to follow along if people like to do that i'm going to start on page 46 and I'll just do a little summary too, um, so that people know what this is about. So um, this is a story about a 40 year old woman named Sharifa who goes to India um, um, on a marriage saving trip with her husband who's an academic. He teaches, um, he 
teaches CAM Lit at a, an American university. Um, and, um, and they also go with uh, her, their daughter, uh, Z, who's seven years old. And he thinks that she's gonna be spending her time um, in India while her husband is on sabbatical um, researching an ancestor, a revered ancestor in her family and also homeschooling her kid. But then she ends up um, finding out all kinds of family secrets that have to do with Kutna. So this is uh, page 46, and this is just a scene um, as they're in the Newark airport before they go. And it's um, September, 2015. And they've just passed through the security gate. After we pass through, we have a two hour wait. Mortiza gets his shoes polished, shoes polished and Z and I drift toward 12 minute manicure. Normally, this would have been part of my back to school routine. I ask Malina, the esthetician for coral pink, my usual. Z scans the entire paint deck and picks up a red with sparkly shimmer through it. This one is nicer. She passes the bottle to me. Malina nods to Z. Why not? I'm on vacation, right? C isn't interested in her nails, but is captivated by the vibrating massage chair next to us. She giggles as its fingers poke their way up her bony spine. I watch the ticker tape headlines marching across the bottom of a television on mute. 6,500 Syrians reach Austria, greeted by applause, food, and medical help. Jailed Kentucky County Clerk Kim Davis says she will appeal contempt of court ruling for not issuing same-sex marriage licenses. GOP presidential candidate Donald Trump lashes out at conservative radio host. I still can't believe Trump is in the running. I shake my head at the screen. It's surreal, Molina says, and clips my cuticles. Murtaza arrives, showing off his loafer's new sheen. He scoops up Z, who is already bored with her mechanical massage, and takes her for a tour around the terminal. In exactly 12 minutes, Melina finishes and tells me to wait for the lacquer to dry. I gaze out at the candy and cosmetic shops across the way, my fingers outstretched before me. A group of Boras in traditional clothing pause as the at the electronic store next door, and I smile at a Ritha clad woman who looks to be about my age. Ridhas are these um, um, head to toe outfits um, that are often brightly colored and are a little bit like um, burkas. I wonder if we know each other, but she only smiles blandly before looking away. I'm in stealth mode in my jeans, zip up car and, and red nail polish, but perhaps they can guess from my facial features that I am of their clan. My father's best friend once insisted that he could pick a bore out of a crowd since we are so closely knit and have similar features. That seems like a stretch, but a part of me wants to be acknowledged by these boras in the terminal. What would it be like to walk through like this. While we have many family friends who don't wear clothing, mom, dad, and I nearly always did, except at all Indian parties or religious gatherings. To be identified each and every day Muslim as foreign, as other, must be a burden. I notice I'm not the only one looking at the Bora group. Others ogle, Gaze is curious, suspicious. Meanwhile, I mostly blend into the crowd. Melina dismisses me with a friendly wave. I blow on my nails to be sure and join Mortiza and Z, who are in the candy store, choose a pack of gum. An hour into the flight, Z, who has been staring out the window into darkness, falls asleep, her head heavy in my lap. Mortiza slips his hand into mine. I like his grip, it's sure, dry, and warm. He isn't one for public displays of affection, but when there are opportunities like this, seated on a plane, 
in a movie's theater, walking alone on the street, he'll reach for my hand. I admire yesterday's haircut, spiky on the top, short on the sides. He still looks like the handsome man I met nine years ago with his strong jaw and dimples. Like me, he's put on a few pounds, the extra weight making him more solid. He looks sideways at me, perhaps sensing my gaze. Glad we're going, he asks. Yeah, it'll be a whole new experience for Z, for us, for your work. And now I have a research project. I'm glad you cooked that up for yourself. You know, you never said why this particular great, great grandfather, I mean, him in particular. Well, he's a significant patriarch, someone well known. So that's just practical. People will have records and stories, but I don't know, maybe he'll lead to something more. I push aside a stray lock of hair that's fallen across Z's face. Something more? I don't know, maybe more understanding of the family, who we are? Who you are, maybe. He squeezes my hand and a warm pulse travels past my wrist up my forearm. Maybe that would be a typical American endeavor when Hey, I'll be teaching post-colonial Canadian lit. From what I can tell, this self-searching thing would be a Canadian endeavor too, at least for people like us. Right. The lights go out and he allows our clasped hands to rest on his warm thigh. I take his cue and drop my head onto his shoulder. Thank you. <laughs> I tried uh... to have a little of everything in one scene <laughs> for everybody. You know, we had, yeah. to, we had to acknowledge Trump, you know, and <laughs> uh, can we not acknowledge Trump? Oh, God, I'm like, I had a mental breakdown yesterday. I think it was it was it was a day. It was a day. And like, I was like, we told you, like we the people of color, we sat there and we told you that this is about to happen. And people just so many people just refuse to acknowledge. Anyway, anyway, I'm not going to go there. There's so much applause that is going on. I see, I see G, uh, JL has uh, said an applause. Uh, folks, if you enjoyed this reading, this is the moment to make us feel special. Let's make, make for Zena feel special and tell her that this was a good reading. Z is my favorite uh, character in the whole damn world. I love her so much. She is the cutest thing on planet Earth. Um, Honestly, like I was every now and then I like run into a Z scene and I'm like reading Zinette and I'm enjoying her, her, um, her like child mind as she is navigating something that is bigger than her. And then like when the scene is over, I'm like, oh, and then I go back like a couple of pages and just read her dialogue. I just loved her so much. It was the best. Yes. All right, so I have some questions for you right here. So um, you mentioned to me before we were talking, you mentioned to me before that one of the most challenging things for you to write is your own background. Because as an Indian person, um, you were actually born in uh, the Sapora. You were born here in Canada, I assume in Canada, yes? I was, I was born in Zambia, but I grew up in Canada. We came when I, I was a baby, yeah. So um, you told me about this, this, this pull between having, wanting to represent your community, but also having to, um, to research it. So how do, you, how do you do your research to ensure that you are representing your own background and heritage? What kind of balance do you need to strike to be able to write about the country you belong to, but never actually mm -hmm. lived in? There's yeah. an assumption there it, that you never lived in India. Yeah, no, many visits, but never lived there, you know. And so I, I was worried about like, you know, my own stereotypes coming through. Um, and so, you know, it helped that I was writing a character who is, has grown up in the US as well, right? So that, so that, that you know, she wasn't of India. So that helped, um, but 
one of the things that I did was I had three beta mm -hmm. readers from my community because mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I, you know, I, 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 I grew up in a family that wasn't religious. My dad actually renounced the religion. My mother was lukewarm. And also I come from a community, particularly our family anyway, um, they don't explain anything. So if you've got mm -hmm. questions about religion, nobody Answers. I had to research a lot. I, I felt like I would probably get a lot of things wrong about, um, especially religion. And I wanted to make sure I didn't get language things wrong. So I had to there's and I specifically said, like, look out for the India references, look for the Gujarati, look out for all of that stuff. And um, so I got some corrections along the way. Um, so that helped, but I was very self-conscious. I had two trips that um, I got to do during sort of writing this book. Um, to, and so I was, you know, really trying to take a lot of notes and soak up things, noticing how my cousins spoke, like the rhythm of how they speak, um, mm. the way that they would respond to things. Like I was really soaking things up. And one of the cool things that happened, um, the last trip was uh, for the first time I got to visit the um, ancestral village that my family, mm. uh, which is Dolka, and there's a there's a big pivotal scene in the book that takes place there. So that was very special, um, you know, as a diasporic kid, um, that was my experience of going to like the patch of earth um, that our family is from for as many generations as, as anybody can record mm -hmm. um, and the actual path patch of earth you know the actual street the actual houses all of that mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. so that was really special so that kind of wove its way in so yeah. I think a lot of it was just being very careful trying to get mm -hmm. it right this 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 question to be honest like when when we talked about this question it's also something that i reflect on quite a lot um i i am i'm quite honest in saying that i am never going to be able to go back to syria there is i'm blacklisted the regime over there is doesn't like me very much one of the main scenes in the clothesline swing is me doing um, um a court scene for their president for the president of syria which is quite a treason i would say so i don't think i'll ever go back to syria so every time that i'm writing a scene about syria i'm writing about a place that i have in my mind that actually i'm not even sure that it exists in the way that i think it does and that that freaks me out every time that i write something in syria because i'm like is this how it goes is this how traditions um are or is this just my own um idea of what a tradition is is this is this influenced somehow with my own experiences or the way that i remember things you know what i mean mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and sometimes as a writer i feel like i am like i wish i can jump on a plane well not anytime soon but i wish that i can jump on a plane and go um, and hang out in Damascus for six months and, and gather this information and re-agitate this relationship. It feels like I am, um, it feels like I am thirsty and the river is being blocked away from me, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And, yeah. and I, I imagine that there's so much like grief and loss infused into the writing then if there is this longing, right? This longing that can't be fulfilled. I I think I try to avoid the 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 overwhelmness of grief and loss when I'm writing because at the end of the day I love my country I love Damascus mm -hmm. I love the land I grew up in and I think it's beautiful I think it's stunning it's one of the most beautiful places and I've been around I've seen the world and Damascus still is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to um, so I want I I'm thinking in the back of my mind that my job is not just to write the story that I want to write, but also to tell you about the place that I have the, the ability to tell you about. So, and I think that's something that we share as people of color, as queer folks, as people who come from different identities. We, we feel sometimes that our art doesn't just tell the story, 
but also is opening a window for others to look into what it means to be from that specific background, from that specific community, uh, what it means to go through the traumas, but also go, th go through the beauties. And I, I have to say, like, as I was reading your book, um, my joy of watching the characters navigate India, my interest in going to India and looking at the country over there and getting to know the country was agitated because you were showing the trauma, but also you were showing the beauty of the country. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, some of some of that beauty, I think, um, I I hadn't written that much of I'd, I'd written some of it for sure, you know, because I was, you know, writing this character who's an outsider, but also is very connected to the place. Um, she mm -hmm. left when she was four. Um, and then had multiple trips back. Um, but it was actually uh, Rachel who's here, Rachel Litovsky, and some of her colleagues who suggested that I add more. Um, mm. And so I started thinking about like, what else could I add? What else did I know? And what else could I show that I had seen? You know, mm. so there was this one, um, you know, the, the, the scene where they're in a taxi on their way to Dolka, for example, you know, I, I, I had, I had those details written out in a journal. And so I could, I could add them in and then embellish them. And there were, mm. there were mo many of those kinds of notes that I had taken from trips. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So uh, my next question, let's talk about sex, baby. Uh, <laughs> I struggle personally quite a lot writing sex scenes. Um, in my upcoming novel, there is so many sex scenes that I, I'm writing and then after I finish writing, I'm like, ah, I hate this scene. I don't know if this scene is working. And then Rachel actually told me that the sex scenes are working. Like one of the questions that I, I, um, I, when I sent the draft to Rachel, I was like, is, are the sex scenes working or are they weird? It's just like, no, they're working. They're cool. Like, oh, that's cool. Anyway, well, we always uh, we always think that they're weird, right? Because they're coming from our own head, and we, you know, we don't we, we live in such a sex negative society that we never think that like what we're writing is like just amazing stuff, right? We don't we don't have a lot of reference, yeah. One hundred percent, and like <laughs> honestly, I, I it took me to read somebody else's sex scenes and be like, oh, those those are so. I read Garth. Uh, his name is Garth uh, Greenwood. Greenwell, Greenwell, Garth Greenwell, his book Cleanness has a lot of gay sex scenes in it. And I was like, oh, he knows what he's doing and I, I can learn a bit. Um, and as well, then I read a lot of, of, of this. Well, there's a lot of sex scenes in your book, my friend, and they were uh, quite <laughs> well written, I assume, because I've never. Um, anyway, this is besides the point. <laughs> um, how do you, how do you <laughs> we're all going to fill in that blank in our head where, where you left off. I never, uh, I mean, <laughs> oh, I mean, I <laughs> just say it. All right. I've never had sex with a, with a, with a person who biologically is female. So I, I don't know <laughs> what that feels like or looks like, but, um, the closest that I have is um, the descriptions that I saw in your book. So can you tell me, and also can you save me from this embarrassment by telling me uh, <laughs> do you write sex scenes, both from the perspective as an author, but also from your perspective as a feminist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like reading sex scenes and I like writing sex scenes. I think that sex scenes are important um, for showing character, you know, and showing conflict, mm -hmm. um, even, um, dialogue that happens, like even sex can be dialogue in itself, mm -hmm. but also the dialogue that happens. And then also, um, you know, it was fairly central for my character, right? Like, as she's figuring out all of this stuff around Katna, she's also trying to work through some of the mysteries of her own sexuality. Um, so mm -hmm. sexuality and, and so sex scenes needed to, to be there. Um, and I also like to get a little um, what's the what's the word like I I I'd like to get a little um, where does dis disappear perimenopause it just disappeared but I I do I do use a lot of kind of feminist understanding so you know I'm looking at 
you know, body positivity. I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. at the things that we don't talk about enough. So, you know, one of the ways that she and her husband start to figure out how they're going to free up their sex life is through, um, you know, these mild BDSM scenes, right? Um, and, you know, what does it mean to be, pe to be people of color and, um, you know, playing with BDSM as well. And mm -hmm. so, that, so that was really important for me to kind of get in there in that way. Um, my previous novel, All Inclusive, um, I have a character who is like exploring the swinger scene. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that was probably the most sex I've ever written in a novel. And um, one of the things that I think I learned um, with writing that book was to really notice all of my own sex negativity and all my own places of queasiness and what were those what were the scenes that I would never want to read out loud to an audience mm -hmm. right and why was that and anyway so I did a lot of soul searching with that book and so by the time um, came along I felt much more like comfortable I, I didn't feel so weird about it um, um, and how do you how do you do it well I think you do it by showing how like human we are right how messy things mm -hmm. are how awkward things how clumsy we are Mm -hmm. um, and and what yeah. it all means emotionally to mm -hmm. for me to be honest like what really worked for me there's one specific sex scene that is that was really extremely difficult to write um the main character is going along with things that the main character is not happy about so he is uh having sex with another person and the other person is doing things that the main character is not happy about, but the main character is keeping that to himself. He's not actually outwardly speaking about it. So being able to look at it from both external and internal journeys of how uh, the, the, the uncomfort is happening internally and eating at the character from inside, while the, the 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 character has to put on this layer of yeah like i'm down i'm cool this is this is what i want to do is something that really i think um worked for me because i i stepped away from trying to to do the gymnastics of having two people in bed into um trying to understand the the navigate the emotions of the character, my protagonist, as he is going through something that I think is is nuanced, something that like there there is a rabby feel to the whole scene, but he he has been giving consent verbally over and over and over again. So so there is nuance to the story that 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 I try to tell. And I think that that's what that's what worked in that scene. Mm. yeah and then yeah. it becomes very relatable because who hasn't been in a situation where they're saying yes but aren't really sure or they're saying nothing and their partner is thinking that that's consent like this, we've all been in these kind of messy situations and so it's mm -hmm. it's it, i think it's a way to illuminate all of that and maybe help us all to think deeper about sexuality i i really don't like um books where you know the characters end up in bed and then scene ends like you yeah know. me neither and yeah. then they made love and it's like what is that like <laughs> what are they saying yeah <laughs> what and do I, you feel I, about that i i agree like i would say that i i played that game i would say with the clothesline swing i was like and then they made love not because i was i I was not comfortable actually talking about sex the way the way that I talk about sex right now. And I'm not saying that right now is like, I am the best about talking about sex. God knows that I still have my hiccups. I still have my moments. And even in writing, I still have my hiccups. I still have my moments. Of course, um, we all do. Exactly. We and I wasn't referencing the slides. Oh, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking about your book when I, when I said that. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. I am, I have enough critique for my own art to, to, for all the artists out there to come and critique me. Don't worry about that. Um, don't we do this to ourselves all the time as artists? Oh. Aren't we our worst critics? Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, speaking of the worst critics, uh, tell me about book endings. Aren't they the best? 
<laughs> no, not really. But uh, there are multiple times when I was like, I'm tired of this fucking novel. I'm just going to end it. So how did you reach your ending? And your ending is a twist. Your ending, like punch in the face. It's, 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 it's right there. So is it a decision to make that you made at the beginning of your, your book through your planning, through outlining, or do you allow, allow your characters to just walk uninterrupted until they reach their own endings? Um, my, if the, the, my original ending was um, the chapter before the last chapter. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was a fine ending. It was sort of gentle and it was a gentle ending. Mm -hmm. It was like, I would say it was a good ending, but not, not great, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of threads that needed to be pulled together. And uh, this was Rachel again, who suggested that I, I figure out how to end those threads and what to do. Um, I didn't initially want to end the book the way that I ended it, um, because I didn't want to think about that as an ending for the longest time. Mm -hmm. But in order to pull together those threads, I needed to figure out what to do there. And mm -hmm. um, you know, in the end, I don't know if it was, uh, Rachel's probably sitting there and she probably has the, the memory that I don't have, but I, I, I can't remember if it was her idea or my idea to uh, put it forward in time, mm -hmm. put it 10 years ahead in time as a way to um, make it a little bit easier um, mm -hmm. for the reader because it is, mm -hmm. it is a challenging ending. But mm -hmm. I think in the end, um, this is probably the best ending I've ever written. Mm -hmm. um, and just a just a funny little side note about that. So, um, uh, Penguin Random House did the audiobook version of this book, and um, there are two actors, Alora Putnaik and Raul Baneja, who read most of it. Um, but I auditioned um, to read the last chapter, mm -hmm. and it's a chapter. It's a it's a chapter I'll never read out loud to an audience because mm -hmm. there's too many spoilers there, right? Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. So. I had to read it out loud in this studio in order to, you know, to, to record it. Mm. And whoa, was it hard? You know, it, it was still not reserved for me, <laughs> you know, after it was already in book form. Mm. So, but I think mm. it's, I think it's the best ending for this book. And that's, that's what we have to think about is what's the best ending for, for this project, this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And Honestly, I, I could tell when I reached uh, the scene where there was the blog post, I'm not going to give spoilers. So there was the scene where there was the blog post and I'm like, oh, so this is where this story ends, but we needed that more. We needed that extra, extra scene. We need, because, because honestly, like I stood there and I was like, why is there more? Like, I honestly thought that there's acknowledgements and then I saw that last scene and I was like, oh, okay. And then I followed that last scene and by the end of it, I was like, okay, I see why this is there. And I really appreciated that, that scene. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to, I want to applaud, applaud you for writing it. I also have like nine minutes and I still want to talk about your dog and I still want you to <laughs> read, but I'm sure people would uh, forgive us if we stayed five minutes over time. So uh, if we stayed five minutes, that's cool. So let's talk about Maggie. Damn, that yeah, dog can, is cute. I, I wish she was here. Um, I have to be with my ex. So um, she, she won't be back here until Saturday. I wish she was here. I would make her pose. But um, so yeah, so why Maggie is important to my writing life as well. She's just important in my life in general. Mm -hmm. I have this hashtag called Maggie with books. And one of, one of my contributions um, to the writing community is that I try to uplift and promote books that I have uh, loved. And mm -hmm. I always, when, when I have her with me, I, I pose Maggie with the book so that people mm -hmm. will stop and look. And I think they stop and look more often than when I've just posted you know, a pretty picture of a book. So, because she's so beautiful. Anyway, Aww. Maggie with books. Maggie with That's books, that. yes. And I hear that your publisher has a code for a discount on seven. Doesn't don't don't you? Yeah. Yes. So Can you um, tell me more a, about that? There's a there's a promo code. If people want to buy the book, you have to. If you want to get the promo code, you have to get it through Dundurn.com. And um, when you're ordering, you 
the promo code is Dr. 25 and you'll get 25% off the book. Awesome. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, so uh, folks, I'm going to leave you again with Farzana to read one more time and then stay, please. I have some announcements to make after. So please stay with us for the next eight minutes, 10 minutes, maybe. Farzana, all yours. So I think I'm, I'm going to read um, a very short scene that is um, the Abdulali character. Um, that's the character that comes in it's interspersed throughout the book. And I think I'm going to end with a poem, if that's OK, after that. And I'm going to talk about why when I get there. OK, so this is Abdulali, who is the great, great grandfather who Sharifa is researching. And this scene takes place in Bombay in 1870. Abdulali, sweep up this mess. Huned, the herbalist's son, was only 17, two years older, but loved to act the boss. Abdulali did as he was told, brooming the leaves and stems discarded after Dr. Chunara had compounded an herbal remedy for cough. He pushed the pile of green out the back door where another boy, a poorer one, would sweep it elsewhere. When he returned, Huned was helping a British officer in the shop. The short, broad man was squinting and making hand gestures while Huned spoke to him in Hindi, pointing to the bottles and tins around him. Abdulali had picked up a few English phrases from listening to the herbalist speak with the officers. In private, he mimicked their exotic words. Hello, how are you? He attempted. The officer turned his green eyes to Abdulali. They were bloodshot with pink bags that clung like slugs underneath. Something for headaches, I need something for headaches, he said, pointing to his head. Chai banao? Huned asked, looked to Abdulali, speaking to him in Gujarati. He pointed to a packet of ginger. You make tea, Abdulali said. One cup water, one spoon this. Just then, Dr. Chunara returned from his errands and took the packet from Abdulali's hands. What are the symptoms? The officer repeated his ailment, this time rubbing his temples to demonstrate his distress. Take the tea twice a day until the headaches pass. The officer paid Dr. Chunara. When he'd left the store, the herbalist split the four coins, placing two into the register and two into Abdulali's hand. You should follow his example, Huned. Learn some English so you can speak to the Angres. Dr. Chunara turned away from them both, returning to his work. Huned glowered at Abdulali, who reflexively rounded his shoulders and avoided the older boy's gaze. He busied himself with wiping the dust off the counter. Then he cleaned the large glass jars that held the loose herbs. Dr. Chunara glanced at him and nodded his approval. Later, Abdulali would hand over one of the precious coins to Hunaid to maintain the peace. So that's one of the Abdulali scenes. And I'm gonna read um, a poem. So <clears throat> I, I have a, a poetry collection that I've been working on um, for a hundred years <laughs> um, that is going to be coming out in fall 2022 with Freehand Press. And um, this poem I'm going to read is a kind of aspirational poem um, that addresses, um, uh, or it, it, it's connected to the issue of, uh, so I'm just gonna find it on my screen. Here we are. So this is called, this is part of actually a suite of poems, the fifth in the suite, and it's called An Imagined Miti Sitabi for Seven-Year-Olds. The Miti Sitabi is a celebratory special occasion meal for the women of the Dawoodi Bora community. It normally starts with a prayer and continues with a 10-course meal of traditional savory and sweet foods eaten in a tal, a large round metal platter that's done. This is an imagined Miti Sitabi for seven-year-olds. It's an alternative 
to what happens to seven-year-old girls in our community. It's a different way of bringing kids into the community. One, gather the children, not just girls, but boys too, and those not yet certain about gender. First, a lesson. Spin a globe, remind them who they are. Children of Gujarat, before that of Yemen, Yemen now settlers on other lands. Share stories of Allah, make eyes glow, harvest moons on clearest of nights, invite them to believe or not. There will be no talk about allegiances to rogues who make empty promises. Instead, speak of ties to cousins, to great great grandmothers, to smog damaged trees, to elephants and bumblebees. Suggest they close eyes awaken to whispers from within, to pulses beneath skin. Instruct them to serve kindness, to prepare extra plates for unexpected guests. Make them remember we are a learned people. Urge them to read a thousand poems, turn ears to ragas, paint landscapes, voice a hundred impossible to answer questions. Confess our blunders, how we spurned siblings, defaced our women, set ablaze neighbors' homes, accepted false gods, worshiped gold, believed we were the chosen ones. Ask them to be better, to be gracious, to be merciful. Two, and now Jaman, Seat them seven to the tall, pour water from silver chalamchi lotas over small outstretched hands. The first course, a pinch of salt, obeisance to hadith that insisted white crystals would save us from 70 diseases, leprosy, madness, ourselves. Shrug, tell the children we now understand this was a lie fabricated by men God knows why. Bring the rest of the food, all a nod to the sweetness of life. Tablespoon of kulfi, sliver of cake, circle of jalebi, jubjub, piece of chocolate barfi, slice of mango, pista matai, gummy bear, and finally another pinch of salt to test the tongue. A second hand washing distribute certificates, proof of attendance to be decorated with crayons, stickers, and glitter. Thank you. <laughs> All the snaps, yes, yes. I <laughs> see people snapping, I see people clapping. People are really enjoying this. Thank you so much for Zana for reading uh, from your poetry. We really appreciate you. I am so thankful that I can literally pick up the phone and be like, hey, do you want to come on my show? And you're like, yeah, sure, let's do this. This is fun. <laughs> so thank you so much for the joy of share, uh, jo uh, joining me today, for the uh, thoughtfulness that you brought to the, um, to the uh, show today. And, um, and yeah, I'm so happy I got to spend some time with you. Likewise, thank you so much. And thank you everybody who who, who came today and listened. That's, that's so wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. 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 So today was supposed to be the last of this. I was, I promised myself in August that I'm going to do this for five sessions with today being the crown on the end of those sessions. And I'm going to just move on, but I got addicted, I guess. I don't know. I got really <laughs> addicted and I'm so into it. So I have decided to continue doing this for the foreseeable future, hopefully until we get to meet again and see each other again. So uh, next month I have Larissa Lai coming and joining us. Uh, Larissa is joining us on a date that I'm not yet <laughs> sure because I turned on turned off all of my internet except for this. So please uh, wait for an email from me uh, on specifics on Larissa Lai next month. And also I am so proud that I will get to share with you 
uh, the work of Jill Richardson. Jill, who is one of my favorite people on planet Earth. Uh, she runs the Fold Festival, which is such, a, honestly, every single year, I'm like, I need to come up with something so I can go to the Fold, just because I love Jill so much, love the Fold so much. And she's coming up with her debut novel, Gutter Child. It is out uh, apparently in the wild right now. Jill can tell us more about it. Follow Jill on social media. I think it's going to be out officially in a week or two. So please check uh, her work out. And she is going to be my guest for March. March is going to be with Jill uh, Richardson. So I expect all of you to be there. Um, and that's about it. I am going to keep coming up with fantastic folks and till we are allowed again into the world and I can hug you all in real life. For now, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for the people who are sending virtual hugs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's lovely to see all of your faces and have a fantastic night. Goodbye. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, everybody, Thank you. for being it. here. And I'm reading through your comments. That's so lovely. Oh. All right. <laughs> I am going to end this meeting now, but it was lovely to hang out with you, Farzana. Bye, my friend. Yes. Likewise. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. bye.